Hello and welcome everybody, King Demps here. Today we are bringing you a recap of IEM Winter. Now, we're mainly going to be looking at the semis and the finals because I already took a look at some of the big storylines to come out of the rest of the tournament. And obviously the biggest storyline to come out of this event, the semis and the finals, is Vitality taking home the trophy. Now, this puts Vitality at, I think it's Fair to say, the undisputed number two spot in the world right now. G2, understandably, playing with a stand-in at this event, but they've cooled off a little bit since that major run. Still a very impressive team, but Vitality winning this event, making it to the finals of Blast Fall, I think puts them at that number two spot simply on form alone. And they did it at this event in relatively impressive fashion. A little bit of a wobble early on in the event versus Maus 1916 against a team that is essentially another one of those dead teams. I know we got a lot of them hovering around right now, but probably not the cleanest best of one result. But they moved on past that and went through the rest of the tournament pretty confidently. Obviously, they did lose that series to G2, but G2 on their day are probably the number two team in the world. It's just they're not as consistent right now as Vitality are. Understandably, another team playing with a stand-in. What was somewhat shocking and something that I didn't realize until I sat down to look at the final before it happened was that this is actually Vitality's first trophy of the year. And considering the number of finals that they've been in and the number of top placings that they've managed throughout the year... It was actually surprising to see. Uh, maybe that's just a testament to the dominance of Gambit and Na'Vi this year. Pretty much every tournament that those two attended, one of them won. There wasn't a lot of trophies for anyone else to take home this year. But still, it was somewhat surprising to see that this in 2021 is Vitality's first trophy. One of the most promising aspects of this run for Vitality was the fact that it wasn't all off the back of Ziwu. Yes, he was obviously one of the most important members of the team in contributing to this victory. He is always going to be. He's probably the number two player in the world right now. But other players on the team stepped up, which has been a common theme in Vitality's run, particularly to Grand Finals, is that usually that is the tournament where other members of the team step up. Now, in this event, as you can see, we're looking at the semi-final between Virtus Pro. Masuta was the guy that got them over the line in this series. Across two maps to drop almost 60 kills, plus 24 deferential, 100 ADR. Like, that is impressive numbers. Impressive even for a player like Ziwu. These are Ziwu and simple level numbers across a series, and it was really impressive to see Masuta step up and not only be... Something which he has been, and he mentioned in an interview with HLTV, he's been a pillar for the team, and he wants to be more than that. This was an event where, in certain moments, and particularly in this series, he stepped up and was more than just a pillar, just someone solid that they can rely on. He was actually a carry force. And if Vitality, moving into next year, want to be an even better team... They need to not just rely on Ziru for raw impact. They need other players to step up a little bit more and not just provide clutches, which someone like Shox, I think it was nine clutches at this event. He contributed a lot on that front. And not just in terms of being very solid and being a good anchor like Masuta often is. They need somebody to put more numbers on the board. And it was really refreshing to see Masuta manage it in this series at this event. The other major story for Vitality at this event was Ziwu taking his first MVP for the year. Now, it feels strange to be saying that sentence because Ziwu has been such a revelation since he came onto the scene two years ago. Obviously, last year, he was the number one player on the HLTV Top 20. And so to get this late in 2021 without an MVP to his name is kind of hard to believe. Even though this has been somewhat of a down year for Ziwu, it's not been his top level that he has reached at all points throughout the year. It's still a year that pretty much any other player on earth would kill for, except for maybe someone like Simple, Nico, those types of players. And so it's just a testament really to how strong Ziwu is as a player. And it was very fitting to see him finally get an MVP for the year. As you can see, we'll have a look at some of the stats here, and he appears on pretty much all of the leaderboard pages. Ended as the second highest rated, playing quite a lot of maps, which is impressive. Best KD diff. Obviously up there in terms of damage per round. Well, damage differential particularly, he's on the top five. 
kills per round obviously outputting at a very high level only Nico outputting at a higher rate than him on that front and the other thing that's really impressive to see I think from Ziwoo and something that is a huge testament is the amount of impact he has so look here second for clutches only shocks had more than him and another important factor as we go down is opening kills the fact that he was second in the event for opening kills and top five in the event for open kills per round. Not only is Ziwoo outputting incredible numbers, he's also clutching, he's also entering, he is literally able to dominate in every area of the game. And that's something very few players can say. And all of this kind of culminates in a very, very high impact rating. So Ziwoo, we all know he's one of the best players in the world, but it was great to see him finally get his MVP for the year. Now, the other team to talk about when talking about major storylines is probably Ninjas in Pyjamas. Their run to the final of this event was impressive. It was nice to see them bounce back from what was clearly a bitter disappointment at Blast. And in general, the Ninjas haven't quite lived up to the promise of IEM Fall and the Blast Fall group stages just before the major. Both events at which they looked very good at. Obviously, they won IEM Fall. It seemed like they were ramping up at the perfect time, and then they kind of stumbled at the major. Didn't really have an impressive run there. Went out the first time they played like a really tough team. Admittedly, they did lose to like Na'Vi, Gambit. They did lose to some of the best teams in the world at that event, but it showed that they were not quite a member of the Counter-Strike Elite yet, and their form since the major up until this event hadn't been all too hot. It was great to see them recover at this event. However, we kind of do have to put an asterisk next to this run. First off, up until this godsend game, they hadn't beaten anybody truly elite. The only elite team they played was Vitality, and they got comfortably beaten 2-0. They didn't make double digits in either of these maps, and they were very convincing wins for Vitality. However, we did see the revitalization of Device continue. He's looked much better towards the end of the year and is starting to look like the player he was in Astralis, finally in a nip jersey. And Rez also had a pretty decent event overall at this event. And those are the two players that Nip really need to step up if they are going to truly be an elite team. Now, it's obviously difficult to talk about the end of their run at this event because they were playing with a stand-in. I thought Fuzi did a really good job, all things considered. He got dropped into a tier one environment with no practice, I'm assuming no warning, and he did pretty well. So fair play to the ninjas, especially for beating G2 with a stand-in. We'll talk more about that game a little bit later when we talk about G2. Now, the one major criticism I'm going to make of an NIP player at this event is going to be Rez. Rez is that second star for the ninjas. He is the man who needs to be bringing up the rear behind Device and getting a lot of the heavy lifting done for his team. The problem is, is that he doesn't consistently live up to that billing enough. Here at this event, with Device gone for the final, he needed to be the guy to step up and lead the way for the ninjas, and he simply was not doing that. As you can see here, his statistics, they aren't appalling, but they aren't great either. They're pretty much comparable to everybody except Hampus, who had a bit of an off game in this final, but considering he's trying to call with a stand-in and probably trying to micromanage more than usual, that is somewhat understandable. I just think Rez needs to show more, particularly in the big moments. It feels like he's a player who shrinks away from the big moments a little bit. Maybe a rabbit in the headlights somewhat, but whatever the issue is, he needs to work through it because if Nip are going to have Device and him as their one-two combo, Rez needs to step up. He needs to be more consistent and he needs to pull out the big performances in the big games he had a huge series against liquid in this event he had like a 1.66 rating or something across the two map series which is great but he's having those performances before he even reaches the playoffs if you're going to be considered a top player and you're going to be able to be a number two star on a top five team in the world which is what nip and aiming for he needs to be better than he is performing right now now, the next team that I briefly want to touch on is G2. Obviously, one of the semi-finalists unsuccessful in their bid for the final. They had a very respectable run considering they were playing without their in-game leader. And obviously, that means they had a stand-in in the form of Kenny S. 
And Kenny S clearly wasn't quite up to playing land tier one right now. He was out of shape, understandably so. It's been a long time since he played at a top level and a long time since he played at a top level in a land environment. Nonetheless, G2 still made it all the way to the semi-finals here, a very respectable run. The problem is, is they should have made the grand finals and they had a very G2-y collapse on the last map against NIP. As we can see here, looking at the round history, they were 13-8 up at one point in this map on the CT side. They were comfortably in control of the game and they were playing against Nip's famously poor T side. The Ninjas have had a problem with their T sides pretty much throughout the time of this roster. And somehow they managed to collapse and let Nip take the game 16-14. Now... Obviously, it's not the end of the world. It was a stand-in. This whole event was a little bit of a filler event considering the amount of dead teams, the amount of teams playing with stand-ins. But it was a little bit concerning to see this G2 core again have a little bit of a collapse. They are prone to these weird and shock results. We saw them drop a map against Lin Vision way back, I think it was ESL Pro League, or it might have been a blast event. But we need to see G2 kind of eliminate these, these bumps from their game if they want to be competing up there with Na'Vi. You simply can't collapse in a map like this when you're in the driving seat. I would say even with a stand-in. I think it's not quite good enough, and I'm sure they will improve and get better as time goes by particularly considering we've got some roster changes on the horizon for this team. But I think it was something that was worth pointing out. This collapse was a little bit concerning. Now, another run that is most definitely worth mentioning is the run of Virtus Pro. They had a great event considering they have a new player who they haven't had a huge amount of time to practice with in the form of Flit. And Virtus Pro look good with Flit in the side. They still do Virtus Pro things in making every single game go to like 28, 30 rounds or even overtime, as you can see here. Some of these games were or didn't feel as close as they ended up being. It felt like Virtus Pro probably should have closed them out sooner. But Virtus paid by the round pro, I think are always going to be a little bit like that. So that just seems to be the identity of the team to some extent. However, putting that aside, they look much better, particularly on the T side with Flit in the roster. What Flit does is he tends to play quite aggressively in a sort of semi-lurk kind of role. He takes space and he creates pressure on one side of the map. Now, alongside with Yakinda, who we know is a very aggressive player and will get up in the other team's face, he will make solo plays, he will take map control on his own, just running up connector on mid, on Mirage, for example. Having Flit on the other side doing somewhat aggressive plays, not quite to the same extent as Yakinda, because who plays like Yakinda? Nobody does. But just having that other prong to the attack makes Yakinda's playstyle make more sense within the context of the team, but also it makes James Orping make more sense. James plays such a risk-averse, slow, methodical style of Orping on the T side, and having Flit and now Yakinda as a more aggressive one-two punch makes James' style make more sense. It's no longer passive to the point of being pointless, it actually works in the context of the team. So I really like what VP are doing. They obviously fell to Vitality at this event, but it was a very close series. Both maps almost going all the way. And who knows, on a different day, it might have gone differently. But once this first pro team have more time to settle with the roster, I think they're going to be a real threat. And I'm looking forward to seeing them in 2022. I have one final point to make about this event, and it's a little bit of a downer, which is why I've left it for the end of the video. We need to rethink the circuit and the way that it works because we're getting too many at the end of the year filler tournaments with dead teams. So number two team in the world, dead team, making changes at the end of the year. Number three team in the world, dead team, making changes at the end of the year. The number six team in the world literally just made a change after the major. Number nine team in the world and were higher. Again, a team that's literally just made changes. Number 12, dead team. Like half of the teams that attended this event are either relatively new teams and aren't quite up to scratch yet or are dead teams that literally have no motivation to be playing because they're going to be changing at the end of the year anyway. It was great to see Vitality win this event, G2 get to the semis. It's great to see these teams still playing well 
even considering the circumstances, but from a narrative point of view and from trying to build excitement and storylines around this event, it's nigh on impossible when, like I say, there's just no point building a narrative around half of these teams because they're not going to be around in a month or two's time. My final beef, which is along the same lines, is for a dead tournament like this and for a tournament which, quite frankly, isn't going to matter, nobody's going to remember this event win in a year's time, can we not do best of five grand finals, please? Please? What's the point of a best of five grand final? It can take place over like three hours, absolute bare minimum it's going to take three hours, often goes up towards five and more. For an event like this, which is essentially a filler event at the end of the year, let's just do a best of three grand final, please. Let's save the best of fives for the big events of the year, for the majors, for Cologne, for Katowice. I'm fine with best of fives, but they need to happen very, very rarely because a best of five is quite frankly too long to commit to every single tournament. And it feels like this year we've had so many best of fives for events that really didn't deserve them. Please, please, tournament organizers, less best of five grand finals.